Okay, this paper is called Ancient Cultures of Conceit Reloaded, and it's going to refer to one of my favourite sociological texts that came out in 1990 uh, by a sociologist uh, called Ian Carter. Uh, and the, the term Ancient Cultures of Conceit comes from a poem by W.H. Auden. No wonder the ancient cultures of conceit in his technique of unsettlement foresaw the fall of princes, the collapse of their lucrative patterns of frustration. The book is a sociological text examining the genre of campus fiction, but it ends in 1988, and I want to try and move it forward a little bit, and I want to make a case for why looking at campus fiction might be one way by which we can try and um, uh, uh, reconstruct a world that we have supposedly uh, lost. But let me put it in, in context. Uh, I published a few years ago this paper, as you have mentioned, uh, uh, Living uh, with the H Index, which was a kind of a, a polemic uh, about what I saw at the time as a, 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 a difficult set of circumstances that we were all, all facing. And I thought a focus on number and numbers was a useful conduit for thinking about the academic condition more generally. Um, I'd also been watching, and I think I mentioned yesterday, the HBO series The Wire. I don't know if people are familiar with that TV series, but I kept finding so many resonances between The Wire and contemporary uh, academic uh, life uh, that there's something in that paper uh, about thinking about The Wire as social science fiction, applying it to academic, academic life. Um, I've put up there the summary of, of, of my conclusions in, in uh, Living with the H Index. And what I argued was that the emergence of a particular uh, structure of feeling, as Raymond Williams might call it, amongst academics in the last few years has been closely associated with what I saw as the, the, the kind of the autonomy that was developing in the way in which metrics and measures uh, were developing and, and leaving their origins in the auditing, auditing process. I saw the emergence of what confronts individuals as an academic assemblage, bits of data that might have different sources, but which nevertheless confront you as a, as a kind of a, a relatively coherent uh, assemblage of measures. Whereas once metrics were simply part of an auditing process, and as such function to ensure accountability, they have in more recent times, I argue, taken another role, and now function as part of a process of, of what some writers have called a quantified uh, control. In essence, academic metric assemblages, I argue, at the cusp of being transformed from a set of measures which attempt to mimic markets to becoming ones which actually are able to enact markets. And I'll come back to that point in a moment because it's to do with the ability of new technologies to measure and to put in hierarchical form cognitive labour. The neoliberal university world of student fees and ever greater competition for student numbers and research grant income, uh, these metrics function as a form of measure able to translate different forms of value. And I'm going to be looking for some novels that deal with that, that, that issue about value transformation in a moment. Academic value, I argue in the paper, is essentially being monetized. Even the very act of citing the work of someone else is now an act which results in the monetization of value. And this happen, as this happens, academic values are being transformed. But the key point of the paper is this. We might not like that. We might not like the idea of value transfer, uh, transformation. It's a source of, of some of our discomfort. But it's not just that we might have some kind of political or social or cultural objection uh, to that transformation. The root of the issue is that we are fully implicated in that process. And as Omar Little in The Wire puts it, it's play or get played. And that idea that one has to play, one has to recognise the game and play or get played, um, is at the heart of what I want to talk about and to look at kind of fictional representations of that sense, of that kind of double bind that we're all in. So if you don't play the ref, if you try and deal it in a kind of a ironic way, you end up, as we have done at Goldsmiths, with a £2.2 .2 million shortfall in our underpinning for QR. Now, of course, there's a deep irony here, because that paper, Living with the H Index, <laughs> is one of my... <laughs> <coughs> it's done very well. It's got, it's got 77 hits, and it's done very well on alt metrics as well. 
And indeed, if any of you are Twittering or tweeting or whatever it is that you do and mention that paper now, I shall get a little email shortly telling me that my altmetrics measure recursively has, has improved. Um, but one of the critiques of the paper was that I had a kind of a romanticization of the starting point. If we're going to talk about an, ex a, 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 an accelerating economy, we need to know something about the initial conditions. We need to know something about the, the initial velocity. And uh, I want to just focus a little bit on the world that we have supposedly lost. And I'm quite old, and when I entered the academy, we had these. And most people couldn't type. Secretarial staff could type, but academic staff, especially male academic staff, couldn't type. They used to write everything out in longhand and pass it to a secretary who used to type it. And this material here is called Tipex. Remember, remember Tipex? <coughs> the technology of academic production was so different. You did not draft things out on a word processor. You did not write in real time. You wrote it out in longhand. You thought about what you were going to say, because if you then typed it, it was rigid. You could not move bits of text around. It was a different world. The technology actually was very, very important. You had to produce memos. Here's a very famous memo from Donald, Donald Rumsfeld as late as 2003. Rather than putting a, an email around saying, seminar tonight, anyone fancy coming, you would have to prepare a memo, put it in someone's pigeonhole, and they might or might not pick it up. And if there was a response to be made, they would have to take it back to their office, write it out in longhand, give it to a secretary to type up, who would then put it back in your pigeonhole. The world was different. The world was different in other ways as well. When I first started lecturing, I would put three cigarettes on the table, and I would smoke the cigarettes in my hour lecture. And m most students in the classroom would also be smoking. It was a different world. It was a different world, and this came home to me just recently, we had a, a, a memorial service at Goldsmiths, where, where I work, for a lovely man called Richard Hoggart. I don't know if he's familiar to, to those of you in the audience. Uh, he was the author of The Uses of Literacy, and he was the founder of the Birmingham Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies, but he was also the warden at Goldsmiths uh, in, the, in the late 70s and through to the 80s before he went to UNESCO. And this man here, a lovely man called James Curran, who's professor of media and communications at Goldsmiths and has been there for very many, many years, was reminiscing about Richard Hoggart. And he told a, a fantastic story about how they came to form our fantastic department of media and communications, now the biggest and best, and in ref terms, top of the table, blah, 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 uh, a department. And media and communications in those days in the UK wasn't a, a familiar area of study. And uh, uh, James had been trying to persuade Richard as the warden for a, for, a, for a while to set up this new department of media and communications. And, and James said, finally, Richard Hoggart said, OK, go ahead, let's, let's make this department of media and communications. What do you think you'd need? And James Curran said, I think we'd need some headed note paper. <laughs> Not a business plan. Not a detailed template and a spreadsheet, not a set of metrics. We needed some headed note paper and hopefully someone who could type on the note paper. <laughs> but the world has changed even in terms of the early days of the ref. You saw this earlier, uh, uh, this figure for what, what the world was like in 2014. In 1986, I'd been an academic for two or three years a memo came round to say, oh, we've got to do this thing for, the, for this thing called the RSE, the Research Selectivity Exercise. No one really knew what it was, but it had been recommended in a publication called The Strategy for Higher Education in the 1990s, published by the UGC, the University Grants Committee, in 1984. And I've just extracted what was required, because it was written in an afternoon. What was required was the production of a research profile of no more, no more than three pages of A4, typed, 
showing indices of any financial support of staff, staff and research student numbers, any measure of research performance deemed significant, a statement of current and likely future research priorities, and, wait for it, the titles of no more than five books or articles produced since 1980, considered to be typical of the best research produced for the whole department. <laughs> it was then evaluated, not in terms of stars or scales or anything like that. Each of these three-page submissions, type submissions, was then ranked as outstanding, better than average, about average, or below average. We sent it out, and actually most people got better than average, which kind of didn't really... <laughs> didn't really. <laughs> the point I want to make is something changed, and what changed was the technology of metricization. And what I want to argue is that there came a moment, a moment of the metrics, a moment of the metrics which I think happened in the UK somewhere between about 96 and 2001, between those markers in terms of those RAEs, where the codification and the level of measurement required was something that academics could no longer avoid. There had been a link between the technology, this codification of audit, and the allocation of resource. So at that moment, round about the turn of the century, I want to argue we saw the moment of the metrics. Now, I want to kind of lighten the mood a little bit here, because I think so far the presentation has been really, really excellent, but it is pretty much doom and gloom, I think. It's pretty depressing stuff that we're having to listen to. And my material here is also going to be bleak. But I think we need strategies for dealing with the bleakness and actually kind of humour and fictional accounts of the situation within which we find ourselves is not a bad place to start, to have some kind of critical reflection on what it might be possible, possible to do. So um, when I was writing the H-Index paper, I'd been reading texts on the, the sociology and the politics and the organisational studies of, of higher education. But it really didn't give to me that structure of feeling of what it was like to smoke three cigarettes in a lecture theatre, to actually think about what life was like in terms of day-to-day -day academic practice. And I was talking to a colleague and they said, well, what about fiction? And of course, of course, the campus novel, the genre of the campus novel would be not a perfect, but at least would give some kind of insight into what academic work was like. And of course, um, uh, uh, there's a sociology of this, and this wonderful book by Ian Carter, Ancient Cults of Conceit, is a sociology of British university fiction in the post-war years, and I'd recommend it to, to you all. You can get it for about 45p on, on Amazon now. And of course, he uh, uh, writes about and studies books from about 1945 up until 1988, and it's an analysis of some books that you and authors you might have, might have heard of, which give a detailed account of life before the moment of the metrics. Okay, so this is the world of typewriters, of petty academic squabbles, of a world where measure was absent. Books like Malcolm Bradbury's The History Man, uh, David Lodge's work, which is interesting because he does become more and more concerned with the codification and metricization in some of his later work in David, uh, uh, David Lodge's novels like Changing Places, Small World, and Nice Work. And Howard Jacobson's Coming From Behind, uh, which is a, a book I'd really recommend to anyone who hasn't uh, read, read it. It was Jacobson's first book, uh, and it's about his time at Wolverhampton Polytechnic, where he had an office in the football ground, and he shared an office with a co-worker who he never ever saw, other than to see all of the marked essays that the person had produced. And this is a running joke throughout, throughout, throughout the novel. But if we want to go to the moment of the metrics, we need to move forward a little bit. And what we see is the coming together of uh, anthropological and sociological analytic interest in this issue, coinciding with novels which begin to deal with the metricization not just the metricization, but the change in relation to forms of measure in the academy. So as we have the second edition of A.H. Halsey's The Decline of Don uh, Donish Dominion, or Academic Capitalism, or critically, the fantastic work by Marilyn Strathern, the anthropologist on audit culture, we also see the emergence of a set of novels uh, produced many of them actually produced by sociologists, which I find quite interesting, and I might want to have a, a think about and reflect upon. Um, we have a very peculiar practice by, by Andrew Davis, who didn't he go on to write Doctor Who? 
Uh, not a sociologist, but Frank Parkin. I don't know if people know the sociology of Frank, Frank Parkin, who, who died a couple of years ago. But Parkin produced a couple of novels. The first one, made into a very bad film, was called Crippendorf's Tribe. And this was a novel about an anthropologist who had received a grant in the days when you used to get it as a check that you could then spend. And he was meant to be uh, studying a tribe in the Amazon, but he spent it on other things instead. And when he came to write up the final report, he had to use his family as the group that he was observing. So it was Krippendorf's tribe. And that was a precursor to his second book, which is called The Mind and Body Shop. And it's prefigurative in so many ways, The Mind and Body Shop, and I would really recommend you, you read it. Unfortunately, it's no longer funny. It's about a philosophy department in a university at the cusp of this moment of the metrics, where they are encouraged by their new entrepreneurial vice-chancellor to demonstrate their impact. So they set up a shop, the mind and body shop, where they sell philosophical concepts to members of the public. That's what we're doing. A philosophy department sitting around, having to produce four pages, three or four impact case studies, showing how their work instrumentally shows impact outside of the academy. Maybe that's a good thing, but it's not funny. The Mind and Body Shop and Krippendorf's Tribe actually describes a world which was hilarious in 1988, but is now actually accentuated. And many of, the, many of the suggestions that they make, which at the time seemed absolutely ludicrous, are actually with us and beyond us and even more extreme. So, ancient cultures of conceit reloaded. I want to move it forward a bit. I want to think about what other kind of texts we can go to to try and analyse and understand that moment of the metrics. And the best one, and it came out in 1990, is by the feminist British sociologist Anne Oakley. I don't know if people are familiar with Anne Oakley's work. Uh, very, very famous uh, public figure. Uh, has just written a biography of her father, who was uh, Richard, Richard Titmus. But uh, Oakley is incredibly influential in her own right in many, many different ways. Turned to writing novels in the 80s and 90s. The Men's Room, which was turned into a television series. Well, she wrote this novel in 1990, which was called Overheads. And for me, this is the first piece of campus fiction that tackles the moment of the metrics, the moment of measure, head on. It's a study, a study. It's a, it's a novel of someone called, about someone called Lydia Malander, who isn't completely dissimilar to the, to the author, who moves from a traditional what we now call Russell Group University, to a new university, a polytechnic, and is subject to a, a new regime, a regime of measure. The novel is about many things, but at the heart of it is the struggle of the head of the department to try and impose something called a true, a teaching and research unit, a common currency such that people's labour could be compared within the department. And that's the first novel I've come across where we see this, this concern with uh, measure within the academy. The next one I would point to uh, takes us all the way up to 2006. And it's a book by Ian Mc McBride, actually, Ian McGuire, uh, from Manchester. And it's called Incredible Bodies. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, again, it's not funny anymore. It's 2006. And many of the issues that he talks about, uh, about the casualization of the labor market, about the prioritization of a particular kind of theoretical discourse. It's called Incredible Bodies because it's about body theory. Loosely disguised figures of people like Judith Butler uh, uh, pertain within the novel. It's about, the, on the one hand, high theory, and on the other, the casualization of the people teaching high theory uh, within, within the academy. 
But what I'm interested in is to think about the sources of representation of the current circumstances within, within the academy. I'm concerned to try and look at representations of the way in which academic labour has become cognitive capitalism and is about value and measure. And there's a fantastic paper. If you've not read it, I would really, really suggest you read it. It might not be a, a, a journal that you routinely go to. But if you go to the Journal of Historical Materialism in 2009, you'll find a, a really, really fantastic paper, I think, by DeAngelis and, and David Harvey, not that David Harvey, another David Harvey, um, uh, um, uh, about these processes. This is the, the key quote that I want to, 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 to actually just hang the rest of what I want to say, say on. Armies of economists, statisticians, management scientists, information specialists, accountants, and others are engaged in a struggle to connect heterogeneous concrete human activities on the basis of equal quantities of human labour in the abstract, that is to link work and capitalist value. There is now an attempt to reimpose the law of value through measuring immaterial labour in higher education in the UK. Socially necessary labour times of immaterial doings are emerging and being driven down at the same time as heterogeneous concrete activities are being made commensurable. We have technologies. We have patterns of measurement. We have the ability to construct indices that can invoke value transformations. Your time in the lab is worth your time at home reading a book, is worth your time in the seminar room, is worth your time writing a research grant. The idea that we now, in our everyday doings, uh, generate data, digital byproduct data, that can be reworked. The very, site, the very act, as I said before, of citing the work of others becomes monetized within H indices and impact factors within journals. All activity becomes measurable, allows comparison. So you would think this is a really important development in the academy. Surely we must have a novel, a fictional representation that gets to the heart of these issues. And it interests me that, of course, one of the most popular novels in recent times has been Stoner. I don't know if anyone's read Stoner. It was, pub uh, it was in 2013. It was uh, in the bestsellers list. But it was published 50 years ago. Published a very little fanfare. Stoner is a story of an academic whose life is full of disappointments but it becomes an unexpected bestseller because it's about the value of academic life, the value of academic work for its own, for its own, for its own, 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 own in its own terms. So if we're going to go anywhere, we're not going to find it in contemporary campus fiction, I think. And given the acceleration of, of the academy, of course, we have to look for social media now to look at kind of critical perspectives on these issues of measure. Now, in the UK, we have a television program called The Thick of It. If anyone has seen The Thick of It. And in The Thick of It, a phrase was used which became very, very pertinent. And that phrase was the notion of something called omni-shambles. And this is the scene Jesus in, Christ, see you, you are a fucking omni-shambles, that's what you are. You're like that coffee machine, you know, from bean to cup, you fuck up. Now, omni-shambles is this, uh, <laughs> a compound, omni meaning all, and the word shambles, a term for a situation of total disorder. The word refers to a situation that is seen as shambolic from all possible perspectives. And it gained, as I said, popularity in 2012 after sustained usage in the political, in the political sphere. That scene became a meme, was used in Parliament. It suddenly became a word that people were using to describe their own organisational forms, and it got into the OED. It was the word of the year. So on social media, A website came into life. It was developed by the Faculty of Inhumanities, <laughs> the Department of Omni Shambles. And for me, it was one of the most cathartic, clever interventions that I've come across. 
what uh, various people were invited to do were to imagine some of their key influences, some of the key figures in the history of the Academy, and to imagine those key figures in many of our lives within the present <coughs> Department of Omni Shambles. I don't know if I'll have time to share all of these with you, but I'll, I'll share a few, few, few with you. This is Wittgenstein, and this is a letter from his dean. Impertinent as I am, it must be for me to remind you that we are trying to run a research institution whose funding is part based on publications. The time has come to take action. <laughs> I won't read it. Paul Wittgenstein has, has two bodies of work, that that is, and that is yet to be written. And that is the case in point. How the cock in hell, he says, are you the chair in philosophy when all you have published is a single book review? We understand there are some manuscripts existing somewhere, but you are clearly not referable. I suggest you get a job in Greece. Kant has sent his manuscript for the critique of pure reason to Routledge or Sage or someone. And someone who's clearly too busy has had a quick scan and done a little review for his £250 or £300 of free books. Hard to know where to start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of ideas, too many ideas. The bold claims, but the results end up feeling essayist and sweeping, leaping from one assertion to the next. Interdisciplinarity is one thing, but here the author seems to want to invent entire fields of thought, willy-nilly. It comes across as frankly arrogant and overreaching. Not least, the author is almost willful in neglect of secondary sources. This is a serious lack, and the text feels ungrounded for it one gets the sense that the author is more interested in their own posterity than in dialogue with the community of thinkers. This needs redress. I might, for example, point the author towards some of my own recent work. <laughs> and poor Hannah. Finally got the student evaluation forms back from my bureaucracy as totalitarianism module. Gutted. <laughs> Two out of five in three of the categories. I mean... It's not like I even wrote the course myself. But who has the time to generate new course materials? Feel totally stressed and paranoid. They were all smiling in class, and then this. I just want to cry. Should I have used more PowerPoint? One of them even commented on my weight. How dare they? Wish I could get used to this new system. I know there's something deeply wrong with all this, but I just don't have the time or headspace right now. And then, Levi Strauss had to fill in the ethics form. <laughs> uh, you can't see that terribly clearly, um, but there's a couple of absolute beauties. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the one on informed consent. Does the study involve adults unable to give informed consent? Their consent will be very much informed, subject, of course, to a total lack of understanding <laughs> of what a university is, what purpose a social research could possibly have, and why some crazy anthropologist finds himself risking life and limb for it all. They are all sensible people, so yep, very, very informed, <laughs> given these constraints. <laughs> we laugh because we recognise that the great texts in anthropology and in participant observation in particular, would not get through an ethics committee. If you were a television company and you wanted to go and film people at the end of their lives in hospital, or babies being born, or people losing their children, or people being drunk in the middle of a street, you could do that with very little constraint. If you're in the academy, however, you would be in the same pile as poor Levy Strauss. Now as we move on to new technologies, of course the, the figures of 
Foucault and Barthes figure prominently here, and here's a textual interaction imagined between Foucault and Abbas. Foucault, of course, is really on top of all of these things. He's not really bothered. He found writing very, 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 very easy. But clearly, um, his colleague there is very, very stressed about uh, the, uh, the current situation. Even Deleuze and Guattari, in a world imagined here through email, are finding uh, the situation difficult. And again, you'll have to excuse some of the language here. But this is an email draft of part of a thousand plateau to get a sense of the role of uh, the email within their, their system. Uh, it is at work everywhere, functioning smoothly at times. At other times, in fits and starts, it breathes, it heats, it eats, it shits, it fucks. What a mistake ever to have said an email. Everywhere it is the machine of emails, emails driving other emails, emails being driven by other emails, where with all the necessary couplings and connections, a timetabling email is plugged into a head of department email. The one produces a flow of abuse, the other interrupts. The student complaint is an email that produces a committee procedure email and coupled to it the suspension of employment email. Following, which is a machinic logic, the divorce settlement email, articulating to the notification of public obscenity e e email. I was actually really sorry to hear about that, by the way. Followed by <laughs> the sectioning under the Mental Health Act email. Truly, the mail server, that is, the average working academic, is a node wavering between several functions which, that sort of thing, any good? <laughs> I'm running out of time, I could go on. Uh, it's poor Melanie here who isn't very happy with the National Student Survey. Uh, uh, but what I do want to show you, because I think this little video... Ah, Dr. Marx. Good to see you. Thanks for this coming in for this assessment. Hi. So, Carl, I really like what you did with what was it? Das Capital? Great stuff. Thanks. I aim to please. In terms of impact points, it scored very highly. Very highly indeed. Great what you did with the whole 20th century, those revolutions and whatever. Massive impact points there. Right. Thanks. But, obviously not a peer-reviewed document. So I can't. Count it towards your publications for the REF assessment. And that's kind of a problem. Oh? I mean, a man can't live on impact alone, if you know what I mean? And departmentally, I'm sorry to say you're just not pulling your weight in terms of publications. Well, what about the Communist Manifesto? That had a lot of citations. That falls into the same trap I'm afraid, Carl. It doesn't help the REF at all. Where's the new work? Well, well, I... I got a little bogged down with some of the new administrative duties. Seriously? Yeah, I mean... Some of the... What are you? A posy or something? But don't you agree that the managerialization of education destroys the possibility of independent thought? We're in this together, Carl. We're all in the same boat with that. You think you're special? No, I just thought. Now what about the matter of your student evaluations? Not so hot, Carl. The online module evaluation shows... How shall I put this? Well, you're letting your customers down, Carl. Really letting them down. They're paying for a service and they want value. Value for money. But, but, that's exactly what I'm trying to show. I mean look at this one at random, I quote. Professor. Marx didn't use PowerPoint and he didn't email us his notes. Afterward. Typical. But it's completely tautologous that a student would know whether his own education was best served by the, the... Or here's another. Quote, Professor Marx told us the bourgeois elite from which we come was expropriating the labor value of the poor and the wretched. It made me feel guilty and bad. I don't see why I should pay to be made to feel guilty and bad. Tut, tut, Carl. Frankly this kind of thing could lead to litigation. And as you know, the university cannot be held responsible for the actions of individual lecturers. 
I was just hoping to instill a sense of justice that might inspire global change towards greater equality and the ultimate survival of humanity as a whole. Carl. Seriously. Get it together. Workers of the world unite. That kind of thing. Please Carl. That's not really going to happen, is it? You're a service provider. Act like one. You know what? You're a capitalist stooge. Fuck this shit. I quit. Actually, no you don't quit. According to your contract, you can't quit. Ever. What? You quit. When I quit you. I owned you. I own your. Face. You're my bitch and I own your face and all your organs. Forever. And. Ever. It says it here, in our commingled blood. Now. Bark like a dog. Woof. 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 Exactly. Uh, so I suggest you, you check your contracts. <laughs> and of course, this is, uh, this is reinforced by uh, uh, the great Lord Giddens, University of Cambridge. Uh, I don't see what the problem is, really. <laughs> yes, there is a greater administrative load, but then that's just the regrettable but inevitable con uh, c concomitant of a system geared to the reflexive making of history. <laughs> We're all in this together, aren't we? <laughs> So what interests me is uh, uh, the creative way in which social media has been used to represent the situation that we find ourselves in, often in a comedic way, but often in a way that offers a, uh, some kind of analytic insight. This is one of the most uh, popular uh, uh, characters on Twitter at the moment. These are the uh, Lego academics who, uh, um, I won't show you the whole, whole film, but who uh, 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 represent a whole range of, 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 of activities in ways that have been incredibly popular. They've been able to generate nearly 55,000 followers uh, 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 across the world. Publish or perish, you've just been killed by a dinosaur. Cheers, everyone. The LEGO academics are totally uh, listing this Twitter account as impact on their next uh, grant um, uh, uh, approval. <laughs> um, Dr. Brown's conference papers always go way over. Um, and then finally, and again, I hope you don't find this uh, any more offensive than you found the other things that I've shown you. Uh, the BBC, no, uh, uh, Channel 4 uh, um, had a series on a couple of years ago which uh, only lasted one series, uh, but was a, an attempt to present the Contemporary Academy. It was a TV series called Campus made by the same people who uh, make a, a TV series called The Green Wing. I'm not sure anyone's seen, seen The Green Wing. And, and this was the trailer for it, and I shall, I shall shut up after this. Remaining lecturers, if you wish to keep your job, when you hear the whistle, please move to a new colored disc. Quickly. If you're on the green disc, I'm afraid you're fired. You two have clearly made brother and sister love, and that sickens me. Bye-bye. New colour. Ah! Ugly Betty. If you could fuck off back to Mexico, that would be useful, thank you. Yellow and lilac, you look like a pilot. Bad choice on the shirt there from your husband. If you would leave campus, thank you. That's right, Gorbachev. Fuck a chaff. Take your social studies with you. Professor Quink on green. Ah, you are a fine specimen of striped, bald, backpack-wearing liberal. Get out. New colour. Anyone in beige slacks, off. Off you go, beige. Off you go. Let's leave the Indian milf just there. You can stay, sugar plum. Excellent running, Subo. I dreamed a dream. I'd lost my job. Barrel-bodied woman um, discharged. Is uh, 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 two or threefold. One, I think, if we are going to talk about the accelerated economy, we need a good understanding of the world that we have supposedly lost. We need to understand how practices have changed. We need to think about, in terms of cohorts, the kind of um, 
histories and experience of those people who are often in positions of power and how they differ from people who are coming through now. Uh, if you are in your 50s, late 50s, and have been in this business for business, if you've been in this <laughs> mode, of, mode of employment for 30-odd years, uh, the world really has, has changed. And I think that, that, that we can't really learn much from our own experiences as what are now called early career researchers uh, to, to, to think through uh, the experiences of people entering the academy uh, now. I think also, and this is, a, I think, an important reflection and, and kind of uh, uh, echoes something that's been implicit in what many people have said. Uh, I think the, the demise in the UK of the campus novel as a popular genre is significant. I don't think we are as interesting to everybody else anymore as we think we are. I think, and this might not be a popular thing to say, our concerns about our employment, about metricization, about our exploitation, about how badly we feel about ourselves, our own self-importance about the work that we produce, isn't always shared with other members of our nation states. Indeed, I would go as far as to say that certain aspects of the humanities and the social sciences in particular have become a, a, a source of um, uh, uh, dispute and are highly criticised by the popular media and by politicians. And I think we would do well to reflect a little bit on the degree of autonomy that we still have within our working lives. I think we would do well to reflect in a reflexive way, as we always say that we should, about our conditions of employment compared to those working in the health service, in the legal profession, in a range of other professional groups, let alone non-professional groups. Things are bad, but there are things that we can do. There are things that we can react to. There are things that we can actually respond to in a way in which sometimes I feel we feel unable to. I understand the reasons why, but I do think we need to think about how we are perceived by members of the public and about sometimes our, how our own self-importance can be a source of our own demise, unless we're very, very careful. Thank you. No, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, I've been keeping the link to the paper and trying very hard to get the okay. art metric there. I'm not asking yet, but okay. we'll see. Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes for questions, so who wants to go first? The impact um, and this is interesting. I don't think Neil was um, doing his lady on the virtual. So Jim is head of philosophy, used to be head of philosophy at Bristol. So I have been exceptionally critical to the whole impact of James and even the Social Council level James at Newton for years. Writing a lot on popular press, so very um, submitted, leading in his critique of impact as an impact case study. Okay. Which I thought was just coming up. And I was actually certainly wrong. Okay, yeah. Very yeah. Well. In terms of playing the game, and that's one way of playing the game, you know, we, we, we sort of said it that we're our own worst enemy. You know, the one thing we could do very easily, as we already talked about, is exploit our frailty, put this on to frailty. Yeah. That won't work because there will always be a case which will go, oh, this is real opportunity, and that's very much. You know, so we can argue that it's pressure from on high, but we are our own worst enemy. <coughs> but in a sense, I suppose that's the point I'm trying to make. We are in a double bind. You know, you play, you, you, you play or you, you lose. And, and I think we all come to recognise that, both as individuals and as, 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 as organisations. And it's very, very difficult to think about the way in which the metrics are structured and the way in which policy is structured to think about a way in which we can actually step off that process. We need to, we need to think seriously about it because otherwise the academy as it's currently constituted, in my view, is not sustainable. Uh, in, in many areas of, of, of the academy, despite what I said at the end, that's not how the situation is perceived. The situation is perceived in a way where I think there is widespread illness and anxiety and, and various other kind of psychopathologies. But what does work, I would say, mm. is this is public pressure. So Wallace, for example, you might remember the mm. Teach Denial thing where they mm. tried to really mm. calculate that. That went on public social media yeah. and exactly as you suggested. And they didn't need to turn on that. Yeah. And I think we should get a lot of encouragement from that. that yeah. You can turn this on the 
Yeah. But we need public support in order to do that. So, so whether it's an impact agenda or whatever it is, the way in which we talk, the way in which we engage in, in, in broader publics is very, very important. The, the, the nature of the work that we think is valuable is not necessarily a position that is shared by a great many other people, and in the way in which perhaps it was. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about expert systems and, and the devaluation of, of professional practice in general. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, I really enjoyed that fantastic talk. I'm just interested in pushing a bit more on, on the, your dual role. Hmm. Well, you'd like to think that there were. Uh, I, I think the, 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 the crisis of the academy is, 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 has manifested itself in, in variable ways, but there's a crisis of senior management, and there's a crisis of, 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 of people who are willing and able to engage in, in what is a very, very difficult job in a way in which they're actually able to instantiate some of these kind of critical concerns within everyday practice. You know, Lord Giddens is also a, a senior administrator at the London School of Economics. Uh, uh, Sir Professor Nigel Thrift is a very influential uh, uh, effect theorist and also a vice chancellor at the University of Warwick. Um, whether their everyday practice is informed in any kind of profound way by, by what they write and what they say, um, I, I wouldn't like to comment. Um, but it does, <laughs> <laughs> it does it does strike me, and I should say that I've, my, my term as a senior manager is coming to an end and I'm moving back into a, to, to a research chair uh, uh, position. Um, I think that's the most important issue that we currently face. The academy needs to regain control over the academy. And actually, a good critical engagement with people who are prepared to defend in a way that is clear and articulate what we do within the academy is absolutely critical. I do think that we have a, 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 a lack of good people moving into senior management, vice chancellor and PVC roles. Because it's a really hard job and no one wants to do it because it's really, really hard work. And it's not what we actually want to do as academics. But there are consequences that follow from that. And actually, I do think there is the need for something not far short of a revolution in what it means to be an academic uh, manager uh, now. The, 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 the way in which we have valued research as a practice, slightly, if you don't mind me saying so in the UK, devalue teaching as a practice, although that's clearly coming back, and the way in which we've totally dissed management and administration as a practice. Management and administration as a practice is absolutely critical, because if we screw that up, and we have screwed it up, many of the consequences that follow in terms of the, 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 the disaster that, that, that many restructurings, many, many uh, management um, uh, strategies have been, will, 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 will continue. That we need people who have themselves been academics. We do need people who are sympathetic to the academy as a, as a, as a, set, of, as a set of practices. And I don't think that actually pertains in, in many institutions in the UK. I mean, there, there, there are exceptions, I should say. Um, it, it's a, a really interesting point. Of course, you know, uh, metrics have been incredibly productive or were particularly productive in cer certain contexts. So I gave a, a version of this presentation to the LSE and uh, a couple of people who were, uh, had experience of working in Australia as well as the UK, senior female professors were saying, well, for us, you know, the visibility 
you know, the, the supposed tyranny of, of, of transparency in terms of showing what we had done and how widely it had been um, uh, cited and used was absolutely critical in us getting our chairs because before it was the old boys, it was the old guard, and actually that whole transparency was incredibly, incredibly important. So like all technology, you know, there are, there are, there are different effects. Um, uh, but I think it's to do with this emergence of a, a metric assemblage of, 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 a, of a range of measures which were devised for often very good purposes, which have allowed a kind of a function creep. It's part of the debate about big data in general. So we can now measure so many different aspects of what we do. Um, you know, it's not a bad thing in itself. And actually, as an academic manager, of course, it's useful to know uh, uh, all manner of activities. You know, we saw the, the, the presentation about the distribution of research income. That, that increasingly, as we, as we uh, confront a very, very different set of affordances in terms of higher education markets, not having that kind of information is, is really, really problematic. I think it's, however, primarily to do with the way in which that data is often turned inwards to be used as a set of rhetorical devices, and often they are rhetorical devices, to make people feel bad about themselves. That most academic work, I can't remember, but there's a paper about, it was about projectification. The number of people you do here talking about, oh, I've got this money, I've got this project without anything to do with the content of what it is that they're doing. We need to generate spaces and places where people can talk and engage in academic activity without constantly having to attend to a set of you know, measures and metrics which have a role and have a function but actually shouldn't be used to, in a kind of a, a, an embodied way in terms of changing people's everyday practices, so people have to worry about those, those, those activities. I haven't articulated that very well. I know what I mean. Function creep makes sense. In a different context, in terms of urban studies, I've, I've tried to make, and in methods, I've tried to make a case for the development of something I call commercial sociology, which we don't really know very much about. But actually, some of the activities that, that uh, Thomson Reuters and Elsevier are engaged in are not completely um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 away from those, 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 those issues. Many of the measures and many of the methods that are actually being deployed within the metricization of the academy, of course, originate within the academy, not just within new public management, but also in terms of a range of statistical techniques and measures and debates about big data. Uh, but they also, critically, are in critical theory and in cultural studies and in sociology. That, that when you look at marketing companies, when you look at people working within the market, they've read Bourdieu. They know about cultural class analysis. They know about um, uh, the sociology of the body and the, the, these issues. Uh, but it's, it's almost like it's invisible. And they often have access to, I'm going to say they, and I'll call them they for now. They have access to data that we don't have access to. But they also have access to a set of ethical practices which we don't have access to. So we are prevented from doing work that hardly anyone will read in a way in which commercial organizations, who often employ social scientists and anthropologists or whatever, are not. And they can do work that we can't do 
that will have a commercial value and which will be on television with young children and their names and their faces being presented on television at prime time about the most horrendous issues. Cameras in hospitals, cameras in schools, what the hell is happening? Oh, but we can't deal with those sorts of issues. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis of the academy, both in terms of data and analytics, that I don't think we've really kind of attended, attended to. You know, there is a sociological imagination in popular culture. And, and again, I don't think we've, we've, we've really thought through the role of that kind of invoking of a sociological imagination within games, within The Sims, within SimCity, within uh, computer simulations, within, within reality TV programmes. That's what people think the social sciences are now, I think. Some, some cohorts, at least. Well, I mean, I'm afraid it's, it's right at the forefront of my own personal concerns at the moment. So at the moment, I'm a senior manager and have access to the data that we have at Goldsmiths. But because, <laughs> because I feel politically and culturally kind of empowered to, 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 to not do bad things with it, and I try and act ethically in relation to it, and I try and argue with my senior colleagues about being ethical in relation to, to this kind of data, that's fine because I'm in a position of power at the moment. But as I join your institution... Uh, 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 my positioning suddenly changes and my concern about raising the bar and the metricization of my work practice is suddenly, you know, I don't know who these people are yet. I'm sure they're perfectly pleasant people. I, I don't know. But if they're not, and if they want to deploy that, that, those metrics in terms of kind of destabilizing my sense of self and my, my future employment, then of course I'm going to be concerned. The metrics themselves are relatively neutral. Their deployment within the organizational context is absolutely everything. So I feel it very much in terms of you can you, an empathy in terms of your position within, within the organization, not just in terms of the understanding, but in terms of a, a, a distrustfulness about how those, how those technologies could be, could be deployed. I worked in another institution, um, uh, not, my, not my current one, where I, when I was head of department, I had something called a people plan, which was a spreadsheet, I think powered by Pure, um, where I could rank people by salaries and such like by a range of metrics, such that if I did at any point have to save 10%, I could rank them in different orders to see who would come bottom of that rank based upon various sort of, you know, as a, as a, as a strategic tool for the deployment of... of, of, of yeah. So, um, yeah, this is an interesting academic place to be working in at the moment, to think... Not just what we need to get away from is it being a kind of a moaning game about how hard we're done by as academics. It's absolutely fundamental. Uh, you know, when Vic, a colleague from Goldsmiths, put a proposal together, which wasn't funded because it was too politically uh, uh, close to, 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 to these issues, what could be more important than the reproduction of, 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 of cohorts of young people through the higher education system? The, the, the mechanism by which we teach, by which we work, by which we are collegiate is absolutely fundamental to the life of culture, social, political life. In, so how our work practices change, how we feel about ourselves, how we value ourselves, how we actually conduct ourselves isn't just something that is a concern for us. It must be a concern and, and an analytic and political interest for us all. Because frankly, you know, I've got kids here at university. I don't want them being taught by people who are clinically depressed. I want them to be taught by people who are inspired and engaged and really, really want to do something good. And my concern is we're producing a kind of a blandness, a culture of anxiety, on top of a culture of anxiety which already exists because of what the bloody school system in the UK does to our, to our, to our young people. So we need to generate a space and to deploy this technology to generate some space, some space in our culture where you have time 
to think and to reflect and not to be instrumental all the time. And that's such an important thing to protect. So let's be concerned about ourselves, yes, but let's think about the structure of feeling that we actually contribute to in terms of what it's like to work in a university now. What it feels like to welcome new colleagues into a university, because that can be a toxic experience as well if you're not very, very careful about it. Let's break down the toxicity. Let's, let's not be so kind of concerned with our own well-being. Let's be concerned with that as well, but to some other, other end. Otherwise, it just sounds like whining. And it's going to be a whining that's not going to find any sympathy when we have got queues of ambulances trying to drop people off into A&E and when we can't actually care for people at the end of their lives. They are not going to be concerned with a British Academy Award rereading Deleuze and Qatari, <laughs> frankly. So we need to think fundamentally about what this means as a topic in terms of our work practices and the kind of environments that we want to generate. Well, that and a bottle of wine, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, is that, is that a limitation of campus roles and the kind of work that they do? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not making a case for, 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 for them being the answer at all. I'm just saying that I think, I think I was just trying to kind of think about where there was any purchase in terms of critique that we could offer. Um, uh, we can offer it through collegiality and support and to think creatively about how we can do things. But I do think often the... the the, the, the presentation of a different kind of framing is quite important, whether that's through the, a, a, the form of a novel as catharsis or a, a YouTube clip or a television series or, or whatever. These are sometimes very important, disproportionately important ways of framing what the, what the, what the, problem, what the problem is. Um, and I don't think any of those ones do it, but they do at least speak to the question through a different, a different genre, through a different, a different way of, of, of representing things. Um, but I don't know what the answer is. I think the answer is probably that, first of all, we don't have a very good description of what the problem is. Um, that's why I think the focus on metrics is, isn't the problem itself. It's the conduit to actually open up some of the issues that we're, that we're facing. But I think we need an articulation of what the, what the, what the, what the problem is. The problem must be stated very carefully, lack of resource. How much is lack of resource? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you.